Applied Democracy, our fifth Applied Democracy Exchange. And we hold these conversations on the third Thursday every month, and it is a highlight for us at the Matthew Center. So I am looking forward to today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's topic is on the role that the legal system actually plays in today's democracy. And I don't wanna to talk too long because um, we have a lot to get to, but I do wanna introduce myself and the wonderful team that I have making this happen today. So I'm Rachel Mosness. I am the executive director at the David Matthews Center for Civic Life here in Alabama. I am joined by my colleagues, Justin Lutz. He is our creative director and you'll be hearing from him shortly. And I'm also joined by our McKinsey Civic Fellow who is Lauren Lockhart. She has decided to spend a year with us after she graduated undergrad and has been just a huge asset on our team. So for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the David Matthews Center. We're a nonprofit, we're a nonpartisan organization, and we work in all 67 counties across the state of Alabama, and we're trying to expand beyond those borders. And our goal is to strengthen civic life. So we want citizens to know how to be engaged. We work with them to equip citizens with the skills that they need to be active citizens. And simply put, we want citizens to be innovative decision makers, which is something that um, is a, a highlight of the conversation today is how to be innovative decision makers who create solutions to the issues that their communities face. So why are we having these monthly conversations? What are our goals? We want to talk through the challenges that democracy is facing. We want to connect academics and practitioners, giving you all the space to connect on these issues, which means after I give this spiel, I don't want to talk anymore, and I'm excited to hear from all of you and our guests today. And we really are looking forward to highlighting the innovative work going on around our state and around the nation. So that is enough for me. Since we do have a great size group, I'm thinking let's take five, eight minutes and go around and introduce ourselves so that we can break the ice and start the conversation. But if we don't mind, I'll just, I'll call you out and you can tell us who you are, where you're joining us from and what you do. So with that, I'll start with Stan Murphy. Well, first of all, I'm, I have to learn how to unmute myself, which is never a problem in real life, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm a lawyer in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I uh, have a long relationship with the David Matthews Center. In fact, with David Matthews, he was kind enough to allow me to hang around when he was president of the University of Alabama. And then when he was secretary of uh, health, education, and welfare, and then subsequently to then in a variety of capacities. Uh, I practice law and I practice the kind of law that I hope both of our guests are going to talk about and can can uh, explain what I always tell my students at the University of Alabama when I teach a class on how to sue the government is that you could not live in a better spot. This is uh, vastly more interesting a place to live than Portland, Oregon or Manchester, New Hampshire, if you're really interested in enforcing constitutional law. And that's uh, that's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Let's see. How about Herman Lehman? I'm, I'm Herman Lehman. I'm the former city clerk and treasurer for the city of Montevallo, and I do consulting work with uh, communities now uh, throughout the state. And I'm here to listen. Wonderful. Well, we hope you also talk, but thank you for joining <clears throat> us. And John S. Dell. Okay, I think he slipped away. Let's go to Wanda My Minor. It's good to see you, Wanda. Oh, can you unmute? Okay, good morning. Uh, Wanda Madison Minor uh, from Alabama and uh, moved back to Alabama. Glad to be here. Good to have you. Megan Cheek. Good morning. I'm Megan Cheek. I'm with Alabama Appleseed um, Communications and Development Manager here to support Carla, but also the David Matthews Center and the wonderful work you're doing. And got to work a little bit with Lauren through a program we had, who is a rock superstar. So happy to be here. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Good to see you. Beth White. Hey, y'all. I am zooming in from my lake house, so you cannot see me because I am in lake mode. Uh, but I'm with Ollie, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Alabama. I'm the curriculum chair in Greater Birmingham. And um, Ollie is about learning for the joy of learning. So we are interested in all things that we do not know about. And Rachel and Lauren will be uh, giving a class with us this summer in how to have difficult conversations. So I am here to listen and learn. Thank you for joining Beth. Stephen Buckley. I don't see the unmute happenings. So I'm gonna go on to uh, Dina Erdog. Okay, y'all jump in if, if you wanna add, but then what about Jaron Hill coming from Tuscaloosa? Okay, what about Valerie Johnson? Are you there? I'm here. I'm a university professor and I'm here just to listen. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. And Rylan Dempsey, I see you're from Birmingham. I sure am. Hi, everyone. My name is Rylan Dempsey. I'm an incoming freshman at the University of Alabama. And I most recently had the opportunity to lead Key Club, which is the largest student led nonprofit in the state of Alabama. I'm here to listen and learn. Great, we're happy to have you. And Mary Evans, you've joined us a few times now. It's good to see you again. I see you unmuted. And then Bob McKenzie, we have you. And then how about Marsha, you introduce yourself unmute there. Uh, I'm Marsha Folsom. Um, I have served on the board for the David Matthews Center for a number of years. Uh, I was fortunate to be a student. Um, I claim to be one of Dr. Matthews students, actually. And, uh, and um, I am also serve on the board of directors, as well as the chair of the executive committee for the David Matthews Center. And I'm here to listen and learn and also to support the, the Appleseed Fund. Uh, Alabama Appleseed. They're a fantastic organization and I've been a fan of theirs for many, many years. Wonderful. And Carrie, it's good to see you this morning. Hey, good morning. I'm Carrie Banks, a communications professional and recently retired after 25 years as the communications director for the Alabama League of Municipalities. I'm also on the board of the Matthews Center. Um, I think the Appleseed does a great job. So I'm going to echo Mar Marsha on that. And I'm really interested in um, this conversation. So thank you for, for being here with us today. Well, wonderful. I, I think it's important that each time we have these conversations, I keep stressing it is a conversation as much as we are excited to learn from our guests, that we want to pretend that we're in the room together, shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, and that we are interacting and that you know that you are welcome to inter um, interrupt us at any point, ask questions and jump in. For those of you who haven't gotten to introduce yourself, please do so in the chat. We're so happy to have you. And there are a few people I haven't introduced or called on because they are part of our conversation today. So how about Dr. Matthews, if you would like to say a few words before I turn things over to Justin, who is moderating. Uh, yes, I'm the former David Matthews and uh, I am here because uh, what I'm studying and what my research is on is why uh, the American people have lost such confidence in all of their major institutions. Uh, the press, uh, academe, uh, the schools, and the legal system. Uh, why is this happening? And what can we do about it? It's a wicked problem. A wicked problem is one where everybody agrees that something is wrong, but nobody agrees nobody agrees to what should be done about it. So I'm looking forward uh, to 
your description of what is happening to the legal system and what is being done about it and how those things are working. So thank you. Wonderful. So I'm excited that we have someone on our staff who is eager to lead this conversation. Justin Lutz has been with us for seven years. And what's exciting about Justin is while I'm very sad to see him go, he is actually going to be attending Yale Law School this fall. So of course, I thought it was appropriate that I turn it over to Justin, who will be facilitating the conversation and is very interested. He'll share with you why he's interested in this topic. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, so I'm very excited just, just to dive right in and just to um, give a little bit of context to why I'm interested in this uh, topic and why I chose the speakers today. So uh, joining us obviously will be Thomas Raines from the Judge Johnson Institute and Carla Crowder from Alabama Appleseed. And I wanted to bring uh, these two amazing people in conversation because I think their organizations really serve two very different but complementary functions. So I know Carla's team works a lot on advocacy and you know uh, advocating for criminal justice reform. They have some good news about bills going through the legislature right now, which um, she'll talk about shortly. And uh, Thomas Rain's organization is really dedicated to sharing the legacy of Judge Johnson and teaching people about the importance of public participation in our legal systems, whether it's on a, a jury or um, otherwise. And I, I know that a lot of people talk about similarities between uh, our country during the time of Judge Johnson's um, judgeship and now. And so I think it's a really interesting perspective to have to see what his legacy is, how it reflects on the current issues that are um, happening in Alabama, and sort of what it can teach us. Um, so we're excited to have them here today. If you anyone has a question, you can click the little hand raise button or you can just jump in. You don't have to be shy. But um, we're going to start off with introductions. So I'll let uh, Carla start out and then we'll uh, go to Thomas and I have a few questions lined up after that. Thank you, Justin, and thanks to the David Matthews Center for this invitation. I'm so honored to speak before this group. I see some familiar names and faces. Um, so briefly, um, I am a lawyer and former journalist. Um, I spent about 15 years in journalism before deciding that some of the issues, the problems with the criminal punishment system couldn't be told from both sides. Um, I felt like uh, I wanted to um, have the tools to do more advocacy. Uh, so I went to law school at the University of Alabama School of Law as a second career, um, spent about seven years at the Equal Justice in Initiative, representing people on Alabama's death row and investigating prison conditions um, before joining um, Alabama Appleseed in 2019. I love the work of Appleseed because we look at some of the most pressing issues around criminal justice and poverty, racial justice, um, economic justice from a purely Alabama lens. And what that means is we can look at solutions that we believe we can bring coalitions together, we believe can solve problems here. Um, and Alabama has some um, particular problems in the area where we work at the intersection of poverty and the criminal punishment system. Um, so I'm excited to talk about some of our research, our ways of working, um, and our legislative successes. I also want to acknowledge we were founded in 1999 um, by uh, former Chief Justice Bo Torbert um, and former Governor Albert Brewer. Um, so we are just honored at the legacy of Alabama Appleseed, um, at the way we've been able to bring uh, political leaders and brilliant legal minds together to tackle some of Alabama's most pressing problems. Thanks again for this opportunity. Hey, thank you. And Thomas. Sure, thank you so much. I am um, thrilled to be a part of this. So the the, the um, my background, I've been with the Johnson Institute um, since the middle of 2019. Um, this is a we I serve as the founding executive director, um, and this is an organization that that uh, was created by a group of um, people who wanted to honor Judge Johnson's legacy and also promote civics education. Um, so we work in partnership with the federal court here in Montgomery with the Middle District of Alabama. Um, we host um, groups that come through that want to visit the courthouse. 
Um, and we also put together and organized civics education programming that I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, but a lot of what we do is focused on um, talking about the legacy of Judge Johnson. Um, and we teach about the Constitution through the stories of justice that came out of his courtroom here in Montgomery. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to start off by um, just sort of talking about some recent news um, that Carl has to share about uh, Appleseed. Um, and for those who don't know, we actually worked, uh, well, we partnered with Appleseed um, not too long ago on a project um, that was designed to get photo IDs to folks who were recently released from prison and jails. And we've had um, some challenges in that project, but we also had a lot of really amazing success with the Alabama Division of Youth Services, um, who were able to get many IDs to um, the young people that were um, being released from their system. So Carla, can you just give us an overview of what the recent developments are and tell us about the bills that have recently been working their way through the legislature? Sure. And thank you for the work y'all did on the ID project. Uh, it seems like such a minor thing to have an ID. We all have several forms, birth certificates, driver's license, or non-driver IDs. But for formerly incarcerated people, um, they leave prison with something that basically says, I am a felon just out of prison. And that ID is completely useless. Um, and it's often months before someone can actually secure a useful ID and they're really in limbo. So that's an issue we continue to work on. But the driver's license work began really in 2018. A lot of our research um, begins with surveys. We survey impacted people across the state. We work in collaboration with direct service providers, food banks, legal services, and we try to figure out from people most impacted by problems what's going on in your life and how can we find solutions? So the, the survey was over fines and fees. When you go to court and get a traffic ticket or are involved in some sort of felony and part of your punishment is to pay a lot of money back to the state, how does that impact your life? And what we found is about 50% of people were jailed, not because they committed a new crime, but because they fell behind on these onerous fines and fees that we use to really support all kinds of state government agencies and entities. Um, and so we found that just the, the imposition um, of all of this debt held people back, increased their contact with jail and the justice system. And then one of the consequences was driver's license were often suspended. Well, we have, as you all know, very little public transportation in Alabama. So if you lose your driver's license, that means you can't get to work. You can't take your mom to the doctor. You can't take your kids to school. It really changes your life, creates a lot of upheaval. Some people feel like they have to drive anyway. So then they begin getting tickets for driving on a suspended license, which I believe is somewhere between a $400 and $500 fine. So one of the solutions we identified out of this research is let's stop suspending licenses um, for people who are too poor to pay their tickets, because that means they're just not going to be able to work and pay off those tickets. So we worked about four years um, building a coalition uh, of folks who work with these impacted folks, working um, with um, several Republican lawmakers um, who understood this problem. I mean, often criminal justice reform is seen as an issue that, you know, mostly progressives or Democrats care about. That is not true in Alabama. Um, that is not true around most of the country. We always work in a bipartisan way. Um, and we have a powerhouse sponsor of this bill and Senator Will Barfoot, who knows about the impacts of driver's license suspension because he's a criminal defense lawyer. So he was our sponsor in the Senate um, and was able to get this bill over the finish line um, just this week. Uh, it passed unanimously in the Senate. Uh, it passed decisively in the House. And now people who can't pay their tickets all at once, um, they have three chances basically. Um, so if um, they're on a payment plan and they miss a payment, they won't immediately lose their license and all those consequences that come with it, um, they will have three chances. And there's some other good reforms that happen in that bill. Um, but the way we, I think we're able to message this issue is it's not exclusively criminal justice reform. People in Alabama can be a little weary um, of you know, the prison crisis and, and what's happening with criminal justice. It's workforce development. We have so many open jobs in this state and we found that about 170,000 people 
had lost their licenses because of inability to pay these fines and fees, not because they were dangerous drivers. Um, so someone like me, I have to admit, I've gotten a lot of speeding tickets. Probably many of us have, um, but all I have to do is just you know, pull out my credit card and pay online. But for somebody that doesn't have easy access to $250, it can just start this cycle um, of, of really harsh consequences. Um, so we're, we're very excited about this bill. Um, our second bill, which is much different, um, is truly criminal justice reform. Um, it is a sentencing bill um, that takes a very narrow look at a few hundred people who are sentenced to life without parole, which means they will die in prison for offenses involving no physical injury whatsoever. So we have life without parole, which is the second harshest sentence in the state. Um, it is available for capital murder as an alternative to the death penalty. But in those cases, people have committed the most serious forms of murder, like murder of a law enforcement officer or two or more people. We also have a group of people who've been uh, trapped by our three strikes law, the Habitual Felony Offender Act. Often their most serious offense was a convenience store stick up or a restaurant robbery where literally they were in and out in two minutes. Nobody was physically harmed. Maybe even no gun was even shown. But because they had minor prior offenses, could be a drug possession or forgery cases, they were subject to mandatory life without parole. And hundreds of people are growing old in our prisons and are really expensive um, because of this antiquated law. Um, so we have investigated hundreds of cases and represented several dozen people um, trying to get courts to understand this isn't keeping us safer, it's costing us hundreds of millions of dollars. The state just signed a medical services contract for our prisons that's costing us as taxpayers a billion dollars in part because of these outdated laws that require older people to stay in prison until they die. Um, so this bill takes, like I said, a narrow look at people whose crimes involve no physical injury and lets them go back before a judge for review. So the judge looks at the crime, their institutional history, how old they are, how long they've served, and has the option of sentencing them under today's laws, which are less harsh, um, or releasing them on time served to a reentry program. And that law, uh, sponsored by Representative Chris England out of Tuscaloosa, and we've got lots of Tuscaloosa folks on the call. Representative England has been an amazing sponsor. Um, we had some compromise negotiations. We got the Attorney General's office on board, and they agreed to a compromise. And it actually passed the Alabama House of Representatives um, on Tuesday as well. So now we're going to the Senate. And that's a really big deal because these second chance laws are being examined um, in many states as well, but there's not a lot of traction. It's hard to undo the excessive sentences that happen in that 80s and 90s era of tough on crime. Um, but the fact that Alabama is making progress has become kind of a beacon for the rest of the country um, in showing that, that really uh, there's no public safety reason for locking up people in their 70s and 80s. Um, so any support that that you all want to um, give to that legislation in the Senate would be greatly welcome. That's, that's very exciting. Thank you for sharing that, Carla. I'm just thinking in my head, like, because I know Thomas is about to talk about some famous cases which involve transportation in a different way, maybe a bus or two. And I'm just thinking about like the idea between, um, you know, the law and mobility and how much those two things actually interact. So Thomas, could you tell us like for the uninitiated on this call, which I don't think is many, um, who is Judge Johnson? Why is he so special? Like, why does he have his own, you know, institute now? And what are some of the famous cases to come out of his courtroom? And how do you educate people about those cases? Sure. So um, Judge, in short, Judge Frank Johnson was the district judge in Montgomery during the Civil Rights Movement. His rulings dismantled the racial segregation laws that defined those times. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on who he was, because I think it's important to know where he came from. Um, Judge Johnson was originally from Winston County, Alabama. Um, if you know your Alabama history, which I'm sure many of you do, you will recall that when Alabama seceded from the Union, Winston County passed a resolution to secede from Alabama. It was It is Rocky Hill country up in the northern part of the state, and they had the lowest number of enslaved people per capita 
in the state of Alabama. They had little interest in the Civil War. And as a part of that, um, over time, it became a stronghold for what they called Lincoln Republicans or Mountain Republicans. Um, and the, there was a, a strong respect for individual rights and human dignity. Many people say that that helped to shape Judge Johnson's outlook on the world. Um, young Frank Johnson was 37 when he was appointed by President Eisenhower to the district seat, district judge seat here in the Middle District of Alabama in Montgomery. Um, and about and that was in 1955. Um, and about six weeks after he was appointed to the bench, he was faced with deciding the constitutionality of city bus segregation in the case of Browder versus Gale. So those, that is the case that came that stemmed from the events that began the Montgomery bus boycott. When Rosa Parks was arrested on December 1st, 1955, um, after a couple of months, uh, attorney Fred Gray and others filed Browder versus Gale in uh, the Middle District of Alabama, which was Judge Johnson's courtroom. They, he ruled as part of a three judge panel at the time that um, city bus segregation was unconstitutional. Um, that, of course, would help to spark the larger civil rights movement um, the, as we know it today. Um, that, by the way, that case was the first time that Brown versus Board had been applied outside of public education. So Brown v. Board was handed down by the Supreme Court in 1955. It dealt specifically with public education. Um, the three-judge panel that was deciding Browder here had to decide, does that precedent apply to, to city transportation, or did the previous um, transportation-related precedent still apply? In that case, it was Plessy v. Ferguson, going all the way back to the 1890s. Um, two of the judges, Judge Johnson and Judge Richard Reeves, um, saw the way things were headed and said, this, this applies. Um, segregation, city, city bus segregation in this case is unconstitutional. Um, as we know from history, that was later upheld by the Supreme Court um, and ending the Montgomery bus boycott um, almost a, year, a little over a year later. And over the next 10 years, uh, Judge Johnson's rulings in his courtroom would dismantle the racial segregation laws um, in public parks, in the Montgomery Library, at the Montgomery Airport, and the YMCA's. And then, um, notably, in 1965, Judge Johnson authorized the Selma March to take place from his courtroom in the case of Williams versus Wallace. Um, that case, that lawsuit was filed after Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, by Hosea Williams and John Lewis and other marchers against then Governor Wallace, um, asking for their for protection and their right to to, to assemble and petition their government. Um, that, of course, would lead to one of the, the monumental events of the civil rights movement. Um, as you can imagine, Judge Johnson um, was pretty well ostracized from the community in Montgomery uh, where he lived. Um, his mother's home, his mother had and father, his mother had moved here from Montgomery after he moved here. His mother's home was bombed. Um, a cross was burned on Judge Johnson's lawn. Um, and he had U.S. Marshal 24-7 protection from U.S. Marshals for years because of the threats that he faced. Um, in our work, we like to point out how remarkable it was that um, you had at the same time in the same place in history, um, Dr. Martin Luther King and Ms. Rosa Parks and Judge Frank Johnson, all at the same place. Um, in Dr. King, you had an activist and a moral leader. In Ms. Rosa Parks, you had a citizen who wanted to be treated with dignity and in respect. And in Judge Johnson, you had the power of the law and someone with the courage to uphold it. So um, we are named after him, not as a memorial to him, but as a way of helping to um, honor his legacy. And we are very much of a living, breathing institute. Um, we are non-advocacy, we are non-political, but we teach about uh, we, we teach about the Constitution through a lot of these cases that, that were decided here um, in what we now call the historic courtroom um, of the courthouse here in Montgomery, in the Frank Johnson Courthouse. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that, Thomas. Um, 
So one uh, theme that we've been exploring a lot um, over the past couple of years, actually, is, you know, a decline in public trust of institutions. Um, and we've seen it in journalism, we've seen it in medicine, and we've seen it in the law as well. So, um, you know, that's certainly one thing that we'll be discussing today. And um, I wanted to ask Carla sort of on that topic, um, with the reforms that you see that um, Appleseed proposes and its legislation, how do you think that um, those types of things increase, um, you know, public trust in uh institutions. One thing that I've been sort of researching is the idea of procedural justice, which is, you know, the, the idea that people will give legitimacy to institutions when they think they get a fair shake in the process, basically. And how do you think Alabama has been failing uh, to do that? And what do you think are some avenues that we can sort of change that and increase, um, you know, trust in, in the law here? Sure. And I'll start with, I think, our failings or our challenges, if you will. Um, one of the reasons that we have become hyper-focused on criminal justice at Alabama Appleseed is because in 2019, the U.S. Department of Justice filed a report documenting horrific, dangerous, and unconstitutional conditions across the entire state prison system for men. Um, it was truly shocking, and at the time, people in um, the governor's office and across the legislature said, you know, basically, we're going to stop kicking this can down the road. This is shameful for the state. Um, what it laid out is that punishment, when a judge sentenced somebody to the largest law enforcement agency in the state, really the prison system, um, that their punishment would not just be locked in a prison, separated from your family in harsh conditions, but often violence, assault, beatings, um, you know, access to harmful drugs, dying by overdose. And that's not what prison is for. That doesn't rehabilitate people and it doesn't make our community safer. When you look at the government's power to punish, to incarcerate, and that's an enormous power, it's limited by the Eighth Amendment. Um, and so that's why the Constitution, it prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. But what the Department of Justice said was that basically by being put in an Alabama prison, you are going to be experiencing cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so it was a real wake-up call um, for a lot of lawyers and advocates, uh, policy experts in this state to say, okay, as advocates outside the system, how can we use this moment to do what we know needs to happen, which is less incarceration in Alabama? Alabama is one of the poorest states in the country but we have one of the highest incarceration rates. We will never be able to pay for safe prisons for everybody our laws require or say should be locked up. We have got to make some changes. Um, so we have been looking at ways the state can send fewer people to prison, ways that more people can get released. And like I mentioned, the surveys, talking to people on the ground who are impacted by harmful policies, we correspond and talk to incarcerated people and their families. And what we're finding is the longer these horrific conditions exist in the prisons, the less confidence anybody has in this enormously expensive punitive system. Um, the prison system cost Alabama taxpayers about $700 million a year. That's more than 20% of the entire general fund. We're in the process of building a new prison that will cost $1 billion. That's a lot of money in any state, but particularly in Alabama. And so for the taxpayers of this state to feel like that is a good investment, we have got to do some things differently. And that involves educating both the public and lawmakers um, about how buildings and money alone are not gonna fix this. It's gonna require a culture change, both in our government um, and um, really in the prison system. So, so we believe there are opportunities to increase the public's trust in our prison system, but there's got to be more education. There's got to be more transparency. And, and, and we're trying to encourage the people of Alabama to ask questions, to demand change. It's both a lot of money um, and there's a lot of pain and suffering and very little rehabilitation going on. 
So if we're going to punish people, we have got to follow the Eighth Amendment and we're not doing it now. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up with that, actually, and, you know, just ask a question. So I could imagine that someone might say, well, you know, trust kind of goes both ways. And people who are sentenced to, you know, prison in Alabama, they broke the law. You know, oftentimes they're found guilty by a jury. So they've sort of broken that public trust as well. And I'm actually interested in um, when someone goes through reentry and they're sort of reintegrating back into their community. Um, how have you seen like for your former clients or, um, you know, people who have gone through reentry programs build that trust back in their communities and how have they sort of, you know, made the most of that opportunity to get back to their community and be a part of society again? Sure. I love telling these kind of stories. What's extraordinary is that we have found many people who survive um, these really brutal conditions, they come out wanting to make a difference for other people, want to, wanting to contribute. So in prisons, you have um, honor dorms where folks who wanna get out of the fray, try to stay safe, take classes, um, they have access to safer conditions. And many of the men that we have worked with who've been incarcerated for decades, they live in the honor dorms um, and they create their own programs because there's so few in the prisons. So we've had clients who have created debate programs and French class um, and, um, you know, basically run classes in the chapel. Um, so the idea that people are in these unconstitutional dangerous prisons and just doing nothing to improve themselves is really a false one. There are individuals who, because of you know, growing up in poverty or dealing with addiction, yes, they broke the law, they wound up in prison, um, but then they land and they recognize I have an opportunity to get an education, to go through rehab, um, to even mentor younger people in the prison. And some incredibly productive and rehabilitative things happen led by those incarcerated people who we have thrown away many for life without parole sentences. Um, so our one of our clients named Ronald McKeithen is a great example. Um, Ron grew up in the Titusville neighborhood of Birmingham. His mother was an alcoholic and was often away. Um, he didn't have much supervision, kind of running the streets, getting into trouble as a kid. He went to Department of Youth Services numerous times and never really got any counseling. This was in the 60s and the 70s. And then he started using drugs and got three minor felony convictions um, and then got a conviction for a first degree robbery. Again, convenience store stick up with no um, injury whatsoever uh, to the victims. But at age 20, he was thrown away and sentenced to life without parole in prison. And he immediately, it was the wake up call he needed, immediately got his GED, his barbering certificate, um, became um, a barber across the prison system, tutored dozens of other people so they could get their GEDs. Um, led art classes and speech classes, um, and was just this, this life force for good and among the darkest places in the state. Any officer at Donaldson Prison will tell you he was the reason that, you know, fights were stopped and that dorms were safer. And yet he had no avenue for release. He had accepted the idea that he was going to die in prison, and he still chose this hopeful path. So working with his victims, who we found nearly 40 years later and who were shocked um, that he you know, was still in prison and working with the DA in Jefferson County, Danny Carr, we were able to get Ron released back in late 2020. And since then, um, he's exhibited his work in art shows. He speaks to kids about his experience. He actually consults with doctors and training in UAB about better medical care for people coming out of prison. And we hired him to help our own clients with reentry because he is such an encouraging, loving person and people who are struggling, who are hopeless, who feel like I can't do this because I was in prison 30 years and I just don't know how to live. They can talk to Ron and see a living, breathing, beautiful example of somebody who's doing that. And we have a number of clients um, who encourage others um, who are there to support new, new people released from prison. I can't do that. I didn't walk in those shoes, um, but it is absolutely 
um, necessary um, for reentry programs to be successful for us to listen to people who have experienced both the horrors of prison and who have been able to come out on the outside as rehabilitated, hopeful, loving, giving human beings. It's so exciting to see. And, and what we hear from Ron and other folks is that there are hundreds of people I left behind in these prisons who could do just as much, who could give back. We've just got to recognize that they don't need to be in prison anymore. There's no public safety reason to lock up 60 year old men whose crimes occurred decades ago. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I have a, a question for Thomas as well, because um, I know that there's sort of a little bit of overlap here um, with Judge Johnson. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Judge Johnson's rulings from, I think it was the 1970s, about the then prison crisis in Alabama. So it's sort of like nothing new under the sun here. Um, so I want you to talk a little bit about that. And then also, if you could uh, tell folks about the civic education part of your work at the Johnson Institute, and particularly how you use these case, Supreme Court cases to let students sort of role play and walk through these issues in real time. Sure. So um, one of the things I did not mention a minute ago, you were exactly right. Um, after, if you sort of consider the bookends of the civil rights movement um, from, from Browder versus Gale in 1956, so the Montgomery bus boycott starting in 55 through the Selma March in 65, um, Judge Johnson had a whole other series of cases in the 1970s that dealt with human rights issues um, that you just alluded to. Um, Wyatt versus Stickney, um, set standards of care for the mentally ill who were being committed against their will for the first time. Um, and if you work in the field of psychology or you um, know someone who works in the field of psychology, uh, they will know about the Wyatt standards, which are recognized internationally to this day, um, that came out of the uh, the court, that, that court case right here in Montgomery. Um, and other cases dealing with human rights for prisoners. Um, Pew versus Locke established minimum constitutional standards for Alabama prisoners. Um, it was filed in 1976 here in, in Montgomery. Um, related cases, Newman v. Alabama, that dealt with the conditions in the prisons. Um, so there are um, significant cases there that deal with that. And we do like to use those as a way of teaching about the Constitution. Um, and I'll tell you kind of a little bit about our work and, and how we fulfill our mission. Um, the Johnson Institute's work falls into three categories. Um, one, as I've already mentioned, we do um, tours and events here at the Frank Johnson Courthouse in Montgomery. Please come see us. Uh, we, are, we would love to have you come visit in person. Um, the, the Frank Johnson Courthouse is a site on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail because of the significance of the events that took place here. We host professional groups and school groups several times a week. Um, here in this working federal courthouse, we've brought in um, nearly 800 people since January 1. Um, since we began in 2019, we've had about 3,000 people come through. Um, and that includes groups like Leadership Alabama and Leadership Montgomery. Um, the Faith and Politics Institute that was started by Representative John Lewis has been here twice um, with members of Congress. Um, and so we love to do events like that and, and host groups that are coming through. Um, but our civics education work is really at the heart of our mission, and uh, we teach about the Constitution. Um, and Justin, you and I were talking about a little bit before th this started. Um, we are getting ready now for two conferences, two multi-day conferences this summer for middle and high school teachers of social studies subjects, whether they're teaching civics or history or government. Um, we invite teachers to come down to the courthouse for several days in the summer. Uh, this summer it will be June 13th to 15th and July 11th to 13th. We still have some openings if you know not anyone who would like to sign up. Um, They're all free of charge and we give teachers a chance to um, interact with federal judges here, learn from federal judges, interact with attorneys who are volunteering their time. Um, the teachers go through a mock hearing so they actually get to uh, learn what it feels like to be in federal court. Um, we walk them through a session on the nuts and bolts of civil cases, nuts and bolts of criminal cases, and how the legal system works. 
And then we spend an afternoon in the historic courtroom talking about um, ju some of Judge Johnson's historic rulings, Browder being one of them, Williams versus Wallace being another one, um, Newman v. Alabama dealing with the prisons is another. Um, and then we have um, a master teacher who is here with us who helps them understand how they can take the, case, um, the cases that they're learning about um, and use those to teach about the Constitution in their classroom. We have um, short summaries of, of a lot of the cases that are written on a high school level. They're to be used by non-attorneys. They're to be used by high school students in the classroom. They're each about three to five pages and outline the arguments for each side um, and, uh, and the outcome. Um, and the teachers will learn how to conduct mock hearings in cases where that's appropriate with the case. They will learn how to examine the different arguments from cases um, they'll under, come to understand the constitutional underpinnings of the cases. Um, <clears throat> and we really enjoy doing this work. We did it last summer in person for the first time and got rave reviews from it. Uh, we're doing it again this summer and um, are looking forward to continuing that work in the future and, and bringing in as many folks as we can. Most of the teachers who come are from Alabama, but we are not um, we are not a state organization. We have a vision of being a national organization, and we have teachers signed up for this summer coming from Wisconsin and New Jersey and um, Virginia and other places. Um, so that's sort of the second bucket. We do tours and events. We do the civics education programming. Um, and then we do feel, as the Judge Johnson Institute, we feel a sense of responsibility around his legacy. And so we are in the middle of an oral history project to capture stories of people who knew Judge Johnson or were affected by his rulings. And those have varied um, from family members and family friends of Judge Johnson to one of the most recent ones we did was a oral history with a plaintiff's attorney from Wyatt B. Stickney That's, and, and the prison cases. So, and as well as we've done one, we did one recently with Dr. Mills Thornton, who wrote, who's a historian who wrote Dividing Lines about uh, the civil rights movement. Um, and we will, we, those will be preserved for, for posterity, but also we will use those for other programming down the line um, as a way to teach about the constitution uh, and what took place here. So, um, that's a, a long way of answering your question, but um, we do um, a lot to try to help people understand the significance of the events that took place here um, and the, the, how it ties back to the, to the Constitution. Yeah, and I love that. Our, uh, our interns actually got a tour of the, the courtroom, and it was amazing. It was like the highlight of our retreat that year, so we absolutely loved it, and I'm sure that the teachers love it as well. Um, so I want to open it up for questions uh, for the remainder of our time here. So um, anyone who has a question for our guests, you can just, okay, Dr. Matthews, please go ahead. I wonder if you have come across a very interesting experiment in Pennsylvania um, in, uh, they called it moral rearmament. Uh, for prisoners. And what they did is that they took the problem of uh, the problems of the justice system and developed some uh, materials for forums in which the prisoners had to look at some things that could be done, uh, pros and cons of each, and had to make uh, choices. Uh, it seemed to work very well. Uh, people got a sense that they were you know, one of the things you lose in, in prison is the right to be a citizen. Uh, you're outside. And uh, this was a way of people participating. Uh, these forums were held all across the country in all other kinds of institutions so they could see how prisoners responded to solving the problems of the system as opposed to other people. And it turned out that prisoners were much more, uh, much tougher on <laughs> uh, one another than people from outside. But it's an interesting experience. And if it, the uh, fellow who ran it um, is still around, if anybody's interested, 
uh, send me a note and I'll uh, send you his name and address now. I have not heard of that, but it sounds really fascinating. Um, yeah, it, they felt it was very effective and, and uh, uh, West Virginia uh, had some interest uh, in it, but I don't have a record of that, but I do, the, there are records about. The, what we do know is that incarcerated people are just hungry for education, um, for opportunities to use their minds. Um, we have a client who was incarcerated for 36 years, and he maintained correspondence with very detailed correspondence with a pen pal, an older gentleman in Texas for most of his incarceration. And you look back over those letters and you see, I mean, it's just this amazing diary of what it was like to be in an Alabama prison in the 80s and the 90s. Um, and you think about, we don't do a lot of letter writing now, like people in the free world, we shoot off a text or an email but prisoners continue to kind of maintain the art of pen pal, you know, letter correspondence, because that's the only avenue they have. So there's a lot more sort of sharing your life and introspection among pen pals and incarcerated people, which isn't exactly what you're talking about, but it's just an area where being cut off from other aspects of social and civic life, people find their humanity through, through correspondence. Uh, Laura. Uh, Lockhart uh, works with some folks in, in my group, um, and you might want to put a uh, note to uh, Sherry Gowdy uh, asking her to find the files on the moral rehabilitation program. And the fact that it was part of a nationwide uh, deliberation uh, gave the prisoners a sense that they were once again uh, restored to uh, citizenship in the country, and that was very powerful. Yes, and I think Bob asked uh, in the chat about um, programs that uh, where inmates can use national issues forums um, resources. And I know that the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Program, which is run by Kai Stevens, um, I, they do utilize NIF materials. In fact, I always say the best forum I ever went to was in a prison. It was at Staten Prison uh, with Mark Wilson moderating a conversation about immigration. And I think, you know, part of what made it so moving was just no one took it for granted. Like Harlow was saying, they're so eager to participate and to have their voices heard and you know to deliberate through these issues that uh, it made for a really productive forum. Other questions? Um, this is Margaret Holt. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm I'm over here in Georgia, and I just want to say first of all thanks to Rachel and others for um, opening this to people from other parts of the country, and I. Um, also want to say in the uh, sharing section, I put a document that I worked on years ago uh, with the Kettering Foundation, and the topic was uh, related to the um, diminishing trust that the general public has in the judicial system. And so what I did, it's uh, kind of like my rough notes, but I, ha I think I have them fairly well organized about what we learned about why this trust was declining. And I just say that because it's consistent with uh, some of the things I've heard said today, which, um, you know, I think it's just kind of a, important for us. Of course, most of the public doesn't have much, fortunately, interaction with the judicial system. So, you know, they ha they have they operate with some myths about how they think it works. The other thing I wanted to say related to the uh, presentation by Mr. Rains is I wonder, you know, I, th I think it's just absolutely tremendous what you describe that you're doing with bringing students and teachers into the courthouse and everything. When we were doing this study that I just mentioned, in one part of the country, and I'm sorry, I don't remember where it was exactly, it was somewhere in the Northeast. I thought it was very exciting because 
the uh, people in the justice system in that part of the country would go into the high schools and actually hold some uh, sessions, some court sessions with the high school students. And they were real. I mean, they re were real. They weren't, uh, you know, just uh, made up for uh, learning about the session. So I just want to say I encourage, I like the idea of what you're doing about bringing people into the courthouse and talking about the Constitution and everything, but I think it really works extremely well if students can have an experience of actually sitting in a court session and seeing uh, what it is people do and how that interaction takes place. So I just, um, it's not at all uh, negative about what you shared. I just wanna say, I think that might be something worth consideration. Absolutely, thank you for those comments. Uh, one of the programs that we do is called Civil Discourse and Difficult Decisions. And it's actually a, a mock hearing that was developed by the US court system, um, but it is, uh, it's designed for high school students and we've done it a number of times now with um, high school students as well as some uh, more advanced middle school students who wanted to come up and do it because their teachers had been through it through our program. Um, but it is a chance for um, students to come to the court come to the courthouse and we will um, divide them into two two groups and they get to argue a fictional scenario that is designed after an actual Supreme Court case. The one we use um, is a fictional scenario designed after Alonis v. U.S., which dealt with um, First Amendment issues and um, threats on Facebook. Uh, they take that and turn it into a fictional scenario that deals with emojis and social media and whether something that's posted on social media as a joke can be considered a threat. Um, and the reason I say all this is to make the point that it is quite relevant to high school students. Um, and the students get a chance to um, put together an argument and then present their argument in front of a federal judge who, who presides over the mock hearing. And we have volunteer attorneys come in who coach them through that. Um, some of the, at the outset, when they begin their arguments, a lot of it is scripted to get them going. But then as the judge asks them questions, they have to come up with the answers on their own. And it is always um, remarkable to watch the students come alive um, as they begin to argue their cases. And uh, we love to do that. We've done it with groups from one school. We've had groups from two schools come in and we push, put them together um, so that they have to work together to, to, to do that. Um, and we love to do that. Uh, and we've also had some teachers who have gone through it at our conference will take it back and uh, adapt it for their classroom. If, so if they can't make it to the courthouse, they can do it in their classroom. But uh, and we also during the pandemic, we try to do it over Zoom. That went about as, about as well as you can imagine. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's a lot of fun, and we love to have groups come down here to the courthouse to do it. And we've done it from groups from as small as twenty to as big as um, one hundred and forty. I think um, somewhere in the middle is probably ideal. Probably about forty to sixty students would be ideal because then you get a good mass of students who are debating issues, and then coming together to present a case to the judge. So thank you for that suggestion. That's a, that's a great idea. And we're trying to do more and more of that. I think that's wonderful. I just want to really say quickly, and then I'll let someone else speak, that I think the uh, Twitter case that is going to come up now in Montana is going to be one that will have a lot of appeal to high school students related to the issue of whether a state can ban a social media from a state. And, you know, I know the Civil Liberties Union and others are, and Mont and Twitter are going to take this on. But I think that would be one that will be very interesting to high school students. Yeah, so is that, uh, Carla, is that Carla's Twitter gonna, or Excuse me? Sorry, uh, Carl is gonna respond. I think you had something to say. And then Marsha has a question. Now, I just wanted to touch on um, Margaret's um, 
uh, the paper and the comments about trust in judicial systems. Um, I think you're absolutely right about the declining trust. And one thing that we are trying to lift up, so unfortunately, it's it's a tough era for criminal justice reform um, because there have been some high profile crimes. There's a sense um, that crime is rising. There's been post pandemic, you know, instability that has led to some um, increases in certain types of crimes um, that are often um, sensationalized by, um, you know, certain media sources. I do not want to condemn the media. There's excellent, excellent journalism out there now, um, but there's just this this sense of sort of instability. Um, and that causes us to question, well, what are we doing in response? The response in this country for so long has been, we are locking people up for long prison sentences. That is how you address that. Well, the U.S. has the fifth highest population in the world, but the 20, I'm sorry, um, let me get my numbers right. Um, the U.S. Um, has only 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated people. So we incarcerate our own citizens at the highest rates in the world. And yet looking at, is this really serving us well? It's tough for us to do that as a country because we have just relied over and over again on incarceration in response to sensational crimes or to perceptions that crime is rising. So I think that has really, um, that sort of disconnect that we feel unsafe or crime may be rising or how are we protecting our kids or our neighborhoods? Well, we're doing it by just locking people in prison for long periods of time by enforcement, by punishment, but it's not serving us well. So I think in order to increase our confidence in the courts and the judicial system, we have got to step back and examine what can we invest in outside of prisons because that would be crime prevention. When we only look to prisons, the crime has already happened. So how do we invest in communities, um, better in schools, in social supports, in families, in drug and mental health treatment? Um, so that's, um, you know, I, th I think that has to be the response. It's, it's really easy for political leaders to make us frightened, um, to make us scared. You see that um, in political ads all the time. It's so much harder to make us feel safe. Um, so how do we create, how do we create real safety um, beyond just responding to people's fears? I think that's one of the, the big questions um, going forward when we look at, at what we want our, our judicial system and our criminal justice system to look like. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Marsha? And Carla, just to add on to that, I, I read an article recently about why people are buying guns and they're using the word protection to protect themselves because of this fear factor. But that is not the, re the original reason I raised my hand, but I wanted to, to add that editorial comment. Um, what um, specifically can you share with us about the situations at Tutwiler? Um, and I know that there's some uh, there's been a lot of discussion about building a new women's prison, but I don't think that that is within the um, uh, plans at this point in time. Um, and I also, um, I have worked with aid, with aid to inmate mothers in the past, and I was so, I was touched by a visit that I made to Tutwiler uh, a few years ago, and they presented me with a book of poetry that the inmates had written. And it was quite touching, um, because you're right, um, people look for ways to, to heal as well as to enhance um, their situation that they, that they find themselves in. Marsha, I'm so glad you brought that up. My first entree into prison issues in Alabama as a reporter was through aid to inmate mothers um, and some programming they did at Tutwiler. Um, and then I became really active in writing about the first big federal lawsuit against Tutwiler brought by the Southern Center for Human Rights in about 2003. At the time, that was one of the most violent, overcrowded prisons in the country, um, and problems at Tutwiler persisted for about a decade until the federal government got involved. So Alabama has the distinction of drawing federal involvement in the last decade in our major women's prison and our entire prison system for men. Um, so the DOJ got involved with Tutwiler mainly because of widespread sexual abuse of the women there by the guards. Um, it was just well-documented, numerous cases not being addressed 
um, by the administration. And so they filed a letter and an intent to sue that went into um, settlement negotiations. So there was never, you know, the litigation like we're looking at now in, in the men's prisons. And what happened was the state acknowledged that they were wrong, that they had not kept women safe, that they had not followed the Eighth Amendment in that Tutwiler case. They came to the table, they worked out a solution involving more security, getting rid of bad actors, um, providing um, just better, safer conditions for the women. They built a programming space um, so that women could have more you know, access to space to visit with their families and their children. They did not build a new prison. Um, and instead, they actually, the population at Tutwiler has been greatly reduced, in part because of some outside services that are now more robust, including the Love Lady Center here in Birmingham. Um, so we actually are not advocating for a new women's prison, even though it's old and the conditions aren't great. Um, if the state invests hundreds of millions of dollars in more cages and bars for women, we're just going to find women to put there, women who would be served much better by drug treatment and mental health treatment. Um, so I, I also think Tutwiler is a model for how the state can add maybe a building or two, programming space, medical care space in some of our men's facilities, as opposed to you know, the billions of dollars we're trying to spend on new buildings. There's still problems at Tutwiler. Um, we hear reports of, you know, there's too much contraband and drugs brought in by employees, but I think overall conditions are safer there. And, and I have to point out some work that I hope Appleseed will, will get into in the next few years is looking at women who are sentenced to extraordinarily long sentences, often because they were victims of domestic violence and took steps to protect themselves or their children. Just last week, um, I visited with a woman who I followed her case when I was a reporter. Her name's Michelle. Um, she was involved in horrific domestic violence as a very young woman um, and ended up serving 30 years day for day for a domestic violence related homicide. Um, so she spent most of her life in Tutwiler prison. And in the last five years, um, she's been out and is creating this amazing life for herself after experiencing all this trauma. Um, she's buying a house. She has a great job in manufacturing. She's raising three dogs. Um, I just admire her so much. And it just shows like the resilience of people who come from those horrific situations. But also, Michelle didn't need to be in prison for 30 years. Um, so... I hope that we can look at more of these cases and 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 start talking about the over incarceration of women as we've been focusing on the over incarceration of men. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Um, okay, Stan, I'm going to put you on the spot. Stan has a personal story about Judge Johnson he wants to tell. <laughs> so let's bring Stan in here. Well, I've got a lot of personal stories about Judge Johnson. I'm not sure. I'll go into all of them, but I had the honor of actually watching him try the Wyatt versus Stickney case, and a case which started in my living room, incidentally, with a colleague of David and the University of Alabama Psychology Department and a great civil rights lawyer, George Dean. And this is a, this is a question that I want to ask Thomas Raines. And one of the things that there's nobody admires Frank Johnson any more than I do. And probably nobody among us, with maybe David's exception, who has spent more time with him and watching his cases and studying. That being said, I'm worried that the 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 beatification of Frank Johnson to turn him into a relic that will become an anachronism that will have a degree of romantic. Uh, re 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 revisionist history attached to him may somehow diminish the reality that what Carla deals with daily and others in this are the very much, they're not artifacts at all. They're the living remainders of the work that Judge Johnson and Ira DeMint and Clifford Durr and Chuck Morgan and Saul C and George Dean did all the time. You know, Frank Johnson sitting in the courthouse in uh, Burlington, Vermont, wherever the hell Burlington is, would there would not be a, a building named after him. He would be the same honest, good, straight shooting judge. But here, uh, thanks to a syndrome which Judge Johnson actually named and which Ira DeMint expounded upon when Ira became a federal judge in that same building, 
the Alabama punting syndrome in which politicians, Marsh is very familiar with this, politicians in Alabama have made a political career knowing full well what the United States Constitution requires, deciding not to obey that, requiring a federal judge, in many cases early on Frank Johnson, to come in and explain to them what the Constitution required them to do, and then building a, a political career on the vilification of the federal judge and the federal court system. So I'm concerned, Thomas, that we may do historically to Frank Johnson what we've done to Harper Lee, which is turn an Atticus Finch into something that he never was or never was intended to be, but more of a historic metaphor for age gone by, when in fact, as you pointed out, Judge Johnson's legacy is in, uh, not just in race, happened to be the predominant issue, but in prisons and mental health and children's rights and the First Amendment. My mother practiced law in this state for 15 years before she could sit on a jury. Thanks to Frank Johnson and thanks to Chuck Morgan, who brought the case, she and other women among our society are able to sit on civil and criminal juries in them. So it's a, it's a very expanded leg legacy, but it's a living thing. It's a very organic, continuingly important issue. And I don't know whether, I don't know whether we're attentive enough to that. And, and I don't even know whether you think that's a problem, Thomas, but it, it seems to me like it's a real danger of the beatification process. So I'll shut up. I, I will say for a while, my mother was, was chair of the Human Rights Committee at Todd Weiler and the state cattle ranch and all the auxiliary prison systems until the Fifth Circuit reversed Judge Johnson's uh, ruling on prison conditions, that part of it. I'll shut up. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Yeah, Stan, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I actually think that's a problem with a lot of figures throughout history, um, you know, uh, that we tend to sanitize them and 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 beatify them, as you said. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, the desire for the board and and with the with the Johnson Institute, with the board of the Johnson Institute is is to create a living, breathing institute. And it was um, there's a very specific um uh directive to the organization to me as the executive director to make sure this is not just a museum and as they say not just another museum we have a lot of great museums in montgomery but the the, the johnson institute um is meant to be a living breathing institute that's doing a lot of things around the constitution and we're not a memorial to him um and one of the ways we're taking steps to make sure that that is not what we become um, is looking at other issues that are not specific to his cases. So often we use his cases in in our lessons and, and classes, but um, we also do things like CD3 that are focused on modern issues around social media um, and other and other constitutional issues. So um, that's something that that I think about a lot because when we bring when we bring groups into the courthouse, um, a lot of them want to learn about the history that took place here. They want to learn about Judge Johnson, um, and we are happy to do that. But what we try to do when they come in is, is focus on the Constitution and teaching about the Constitution, um, because there's a lot more that has taken place, and there's a lot more that this building stands for, the Frank Johnson Courthouse, than just his legacy, uh, if that makes sense. I'm really glad you mentioned that. That's something that we think about on a regular basis. Okay. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Who's up next? Okay, well, I have a banger if nobody's gonna ask a question. Um, I, I'm i curious for both Carla and Thomas, um, what, and not just in Alabama, but generally, what constitutional principles do you think are most challenged or threatened today? 
<laughs> I know it's a big one. And I'd like to hear from the, anyone in the audience too, as well as, you know, sort of what you think, but, you know, we're talking about the constitution. We've talked about the eighth amendment. We've talked about, you know, all these different things and the role of the federal judiciary in protecting these rights. And I'm just curious, you know, with, without your Appleseed or Johnson Institute hat on necessarily, like which ones do you think are, are currently threatened or maybe just need renewing? Well, I, I will start, but I'm gonna um, I, I'm gonna punt. Uh, I'm not going to hopefully not fall into Alabama punting syndrome that, <laughs> that Stan mentioned. But um, um, you know, we work uh, closely with the federal court here, and and I am going to leave up to others to decide what is most threatened. But I will say that um, we put out a, a video for Law Day um, on May the 1st, which is May the 1st every year. And um, you can go to our website and check out the previous um, recognitions we've done for Law Day and, and uh, diving into the theme of that year that's set by the American Bar Association. But um, in our latest video for this year, we um, sat down with several of the judges here from the court to discuss the issues, um, which was of, of the theme, which was cornerstones of democracy. And in that discussion, one of the issues came up, what's the most important right? What's the most important right laid out by the Constitution? And um, the response came from one of the judges was um, freedom of speech in the First Amendment. Um, and um, if in conversations I've had with a number of the, the folks here in the court, I think that I don't know if I would say that there's consensus, but um, that seems to rise uh, to the top. And I know um, I am a former journalist. I know Carla is a former journalist. I'm a former teacher, too. And I can tell you that I think the freedom of, the, the, the freedom of speech is um, absolutely critical to, to the country. So I'm going to leave it there and put myself back on mute. Yeah. Well, I guess it was, you know, it's first for a reason, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, Carla. So the only amendment that I generally talk about is the eighth, but um, I do want to say, I think I have real concerns with voting rights, um, particularly in Alabama. Uh, there's a bill HB 209 that would make it a felony to assist anyone with an absentee ballot. Um, just a number of assaults on voting that's happening, not just here, but around the country. Um, that means if um, I have a neighbor um, who is, you know, visually impaired, that I can't assist them with a ballot, that I can't deliver ballots to um, jails where many people have not lost the right to vote. Um, so that's really concerning. Um, but another Eighth Amendment issue I just want to highlight um, is around the death penalty. Um, Alabama has the distinction of having three recent botched executions. And this means that um, untrained executioners stick needles all over people and are unable to access a vein. Um, and so they've had to stop those executions. And instead of investigating by outside authorities um, or unbiased officials um, what's really happening, we did a, a brief internal investigation in the Department of Corrections. And the state's response has just been to extend the length of time that executioners have to access a vein and kill people, which means the torture could go on um, for days. Um, this is this should be unconstitutional, but because it's it's done very secretly in all of our names, um, we we may not know what really happens. Um, um, so I think um, it is incumbent upon those of us um, you know, who, who know about what's happening uh, with the death penalty to, to try to raise our voices. Um, history will not judge Alabama kind, um, kindly with regard to many Eighth Amendment issues, but when the government in our names is taking human life, um, I think it's especially important to know what's happening. Um, and that has been our response in this state to botched executions. Yeah, that's a, that's a good response. Um, okay, any, any more questions? Well, I'm gonna wrap it up there. I'm gonna turn it over to either Dr. Matthews or Rachel for some closing thoughts. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Carla. This has been a really great conversation, very eye-opening. Um, and I thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Matthews, before we wrap it up, do you have anything you would like to say? Yeah, I, I think, um... The points in the uh, discussion that we, were very useful, 
were particularly those where people began to talk about not just what the problem was, but what they were doing about it and what results they were getting and, and how those, that opens the door to how those results can be better. So this is not simply a diagnostic uh, session, but uh, a, a look at what things might be done that we're not now doing. I think that's good. I agree. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And if you're available in June on the third Thursday at noon central time, I hope to see you here. And just thank you again. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. This is thank great. You.